Yeah. So hi everyone. Welcome to the ICTS String Seminar. So today we have Eva Silverstein from Stanford. Will be talking to us about the matter with TT bar and lambda. Over to you, Eva. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind invitation and um, staying late to hear about this. So um, this is going to be ultimately. I'm going to get to some work in progress on uh, the. We'll see what this means with the bulk matter content associated with the um, duality between uh, Desitter static patch and uh, these uh, TT bar style theories. Um, um, but it's based on you know a series of works uh, in in my group of these wonderful collaborators and uh, connects very nicely to quite a few other works these days. Um, so that's part of the <clears throat> fun of the subject nowadays is people are not so much in their own world and <laughs> their own observer patch and consider uh, holography research, but instead um, things are starting to come together. So <clears throat> just to go very to the beginning, um, we all know general relativity predicts horizons and they're also observed, uh, of course, indirectly, but observed very clearly in nature. Um, the black hole case going back to the seventies, it was understood that there's this interesting connection to thermodynamics between the, the black hole dynamics and thermodynamics, um, which suggested maybe a statistical interpretation, which would entail there being a finite number of available states, uh, and in particular, discrete quantization of the levels. And, you know, this is still in progress in the most general case, but for super special black holes, meaning highly supersymmetric ones, uh, one of the successes of string theory was to achieve such a count. And the method there um, that I want to review um, to contrast with the cosmological case or compare to it is there uh, one could use make heavy use of supersymmetry, extended supersymmetry to do a state count in a region of um, parameter space, basically, where the um, count is easy, so the Stebrain picture, and then follow it unchanged using the theorems of supersymmetry to the regime where it's uh, a real black hole. I mean, again, a very special kind of black hole, but still a black hole. Um, and the state count worked out uh, in, those, in those calculations. Um, and <clears throat> in the cosmological case, uh, as we'll review, we have a similar indication of some sort of statistical description, um, but supersymmetry is not relevant at all. Um, but there's another technique which came kind of out of the blue in the landscape of theoretical physics, uh, which 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 goes under the name of integrable deformations, where we can play a similar game, but in this case, um, use this technique, uh, which was introduced by Zomologikov and companies, Dubovsky and company, um, to uh, control a, a state count over a long trajectory in theory space. Uh, in an analogous but but different way. Um, so so indeed, um, this kind of hint of a, of a thermodynamic interpretation of of De Sitter occurred in the seventies around the same time, and um, it's developed over the years. A, a recent kind of refinement of the Gibbons Hawking calculation of uh, what would be the entropy of the observer horizon in De Sitter was carried out in uh, as recently as 2019, showing uh, that universally, meaning just including the, the gravitational sector of, of whatever theory might be living here, uh, there's not only the area term, but there's specifically a minus three log of, of that area term um, in, in the entropy as computed in, on, in gravity. Um, and also recently coming at things from a gravitational perspective that meshes very nicely with, with what I'll tell you, uh, it, was, it was understood how to interpret this in a more familiar way by, as we'll see, introducing a, a boundary um, or thinking about sometimes what might be the generic case where there, there is a boundary in the system, um, at which point things like the first law behave in a more um, familiar way. Okay, so um, let me uh, go slowly. So this, as with the black holes, this suggests that there should be 
or possibly could be a finite Hilbert space that should capture the, the observer patch. And this has been an idea that's been around a long time. Here are some, some of the many references on it. Okay, so let's keep this in mind. Let's also keep in mind this log correction, which will, which will play a role for us. Okay, so um, in the cosmological case, one might think it's just, uh, you know, a dramatically different degree of difficulty. And I, I myself thought this for a long time. Um, because if you focus on the global de Sitter case, uh, which is, you know, a good approximation to the, what we see in, in nature um, early in the universe and late in the universe, um, then you never escape gravity. So unlike in the case of ADS-CFT, where you have this boundary at which gravity uh, freezes, uh, instead in the global picture of this closed universe, and that would also include its decays in, in string theory and so on, um, you, you never decouple gravity. Um, and uh, similarly, there's no notion of, of a global energy that is useful. Um, however, people have considered, and in math, it's a natural thing, certainly, and also in GR, um, to consider a time-like boundary, regardless of whether it's positive or negative cosmological constant. Um, and there's a proposed notion of energy, which is the Brown-York energy. In fact, this is the the stress energy tensor that, that was uh, also identified as the right one in, in ADS-CFT as well. Um, but on, in more, more generality, one can consider a time-like boundary, um, uh, this notion of energy, which I'll review. Um, and the benefit of that technically, aside from you know, perhaps even being the generic case <laughs> in some sense, um, is that if it makes sense to put a fixed boundary condition at such a boundary, that means gravity at the boundary is not fluctuating. Um, there can be a net energy. It's this brown York energy. That um, and the exciting thing in the a year or so ago that um, there's a precise agreement between the de Sitter, um, also bounded patches of ADS, and the energy that you can calculate it using this technique earlier of integrability of deformation of a holographic CFT. Uh, there's a gravitational notion of energy and a boundary notion of energy that um, one honestly computes in the putative dual 2D or 3D uh, bulk, I should say, and 2D boundary. There's a uh, exact agreement between these two things as a function of where you put the boundary. So there's a functional match of the energies and, the, and, the, and those energies um, are directly tied to the, the bulk geometry. Um, they, on the gravity side, it's related to the extrinsic curvature at the, at the boundary. And so as you move the boundary around, you're getting a, a function's worth of tests of, of the geometry. So this is an agreement of the emergent radial geometry between the two sides of this of this um, of this sort of duality, and also at the same time the state count goes along for the ride, uh, much in the same way that it did, does for extended supersymmetry. It does here uh, uh, for for reasons that we'll review, um, and so that the you know for these two tests this duality fits on the nose, um, so. Um, you know, what's the matter with it? Well, it's in 3D, which is not realistic. And also uh, this duality that, that you know, I'm summarizing here and we'll review um, any of the kind of niggling subleading details of the bulk matter model. Um, and there's, you know, some obvious questions about how it works in full-fledged M theory. Um, and those are the topics that I want to get to today after after reviewing this uh, this result first. So um, please interrupt with questions along the way. Um, and also, uh, can you let me know if you still hear me? I had a internet. Yeah, there was uh, some, some slight learning. internet problem, I think. Uh, at least for me, I wasn't sure if it was there for the others. Uh, I, it could have been my side, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, may, maybe it was the other side. No, it was on my side as well. Oh, okay, so there is it still happening? And uh, now it's okay. It, it it broke a little bit, but it's okay now. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, it's a it's a slight, slightly vague question, uh, but maybe I can ask it now. Uh, you can you can delay the answer if it's better. Uh, the the vague question is that the TT bar deformation in in ADS is a little bit like moving into the bar. Correct. So one might have thought that the T, that uh, analogous deformation in DS would move you from the very late time slice to something a little earlier. But you'd like you you will uh, will you say later in the talk that it's effectively like introducing a time like boundary. Yeah, we're going to work with a time like boundary. Other groups, uh, in particular, um, our recent host Aaron Wall and company have been looking at it the way you just described. You know, the, there's no conflict between the two. It's just a a different way of formulating it. But yeah, as I as I'm writing here, I hope you can see the slides. It's a it's a time like boundary that we're going to work with, and that keeps everything as close as it can be to ADS CFT. Um, in in this regard of of then not having fluctuating boundary gravity, and also in some other regards. So we're finding some some um, additional benefits of that. But yeah, time like. I see. Okay, great. So let's keep going. Uh, uh, yeah. Hi, Eva. Uh, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, no, I've I just had a quick question. Uh, is there a way to refine this further with a angular momentum or something? Is there a, 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 I was just wondering whether just as for the BTZ or so on, we have, uh, we have sort of this additional a uh, way to kind of uh, put a chemical potential. Is there some analog of that for this? Um, maybe this yes. is a stupid question. But, yeah. Yes, that's a great question. Um, I might be a little bit lazy later in the talk when I display the actual formulas for the energy as a function of, um, well, the seed energy and the and the, and the the momentum. We're, we're in boundary two dimensions, so um, there's indeed a momentum quantum number on the, on the circle. Right, um, right. So one can definitely keep track of that. It plays a role similarly to, you know, just as you're saying, the 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 role that it plays in the two DCFTs dual to to ADS, um, mm -hmm. and we'll we'll be building somewhat from the the works on the ADS case in the literature, including those by Hartman and company, where um, in doing their kind of counts and the results of the modular bootstrap there, they. They certainly kept track of the the angular momentum states. Those don't change the leading sort of count of states, um, but they they are. Yeah, you're right. The answer is yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, good to see you too. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I, I just said this, um, and it, what it has in it, which is exciting. What it doesn't have in it, which is which is the matter with it. And so we're going to try to address that. Um, and the rest of the talk will be to review this development, put it a bit in some broader context, and then incorporate the local bulk matter, explain how we do that. So, um, which is pretty far along, but still in progress um, overall. So um, what is this deformation that I allude to? Well, uh, I'm sure many people have, have seen it, but for those who may not have, the idea is to define a space of, of theories via a, a kind of differential relation, which you could even think of algorithmically as sort of a step-by-step -step procedure, but anyway, as a differential equation at the level of the action or the log of the partition function, you can think of it as um, a, a differential equation with respect to some deformation parameter lambda. Um, Let's say the, the theory is living on a cylinder of, of proper size L, so the dimensionless figure of merit is lambda, this deformation parameter over L squared. Um, and the deformation is by, uh, at each step, uh, this TT bar operator, which is the de in two dimensions, the determinant of the stress energy tensor T, a universally available operator. Um, and what we, one of the things we, we needed to discover for this purpose we're using it for is that um, the same methods, the same integrability, the same control of the energy spectrum and the entropy uh, persists if we, in this differential equation, also include the possibility of uh, a constant term, um, which we call this lambda 2. It depends on the little lambda, uh, inversely, as I've written. Um, and unlike in just uh, the case of a single step of deformation where this say added to a CFT would do nothing. It would just be like changing the zero of energy. 
since this is a differential equation, it, this addition, this lambda two, depending on a parameter eta um, appearing here, this makes a difference. This enters nonlinearly in the resulting uh, energy spectrum. So it was kind of missed in the story study of these integral deformations because of too quickly thinking it was would do nothing, but in fact it does a lot, as we'll see. Um, okay, so I have a question. Yes, please. So uh, when you integrate over lambda on both sides, I mean by taking the d lambda to the other side, you will get one by lambda, right? So if you if if lambda in any case goes through zero, then you'll get infinity. Perfect question. That was that was the next thing I was going to say. Um, to use this formula, um, what one needs to do is initially, for just the reason you said, start, um, say from some seed holographic CFT that we're going to deform, start by deforming only by TT bar. Okay, so this eta is zero along the part of the trajectory I'm just indicating here. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, so just for the reason you said, you, regardless of any other goal, you, you should do that. Um, but then at some point, um, if it is possible to start evolving not by uh, just TT bar, but also by TT bar plus lambda two, so turning on eta, say eta minus one instead of plus one, um, this point where we can, we're uh, liberated to turn on also lambda two um, is determined in part by needing the this energy spectrum to be continuous there. Um, and given such a, a place where that happens, we are free to then start adding this lambda two. Um, and we'll find that that's a very natural thing to do in the holographic context. So thank you for the question. That's completely right. Um, so, and Eva, if you were not in two dimensions, yes, then you would have other terms on the right-hand side with lower powers of lambda, like root gr and so on. In higher dimensions, that's a that the degree of difficulty of that is similar to that of matter, and we'll come to what what we can do with that. It's it's a it's a great question. Um, right now, I'm doing the cleanest thing, which happens to be a yeah a toy model in the sense of being 3D bulk. But notice, you know, of course, the the whole question comes up in 3D. It's a it's a you know the given talking plus a Nuno said all and so on that comes up in 3D. So it's a, it's a valid question in 3D. Um, I'm with you though, that um, we should take reality seriously. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so hold that thought and we'll get there. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going kind of slowly, but I really want to make sure the, the, the groundwork for this is clear. So um, you have this differential equation. Um, I'm going to do a quick and dirty summary of the methods these folks uh, introduced to be able to control the energy spectrum all along the deformation. I should stress that the seed theory we start with need not be integrable. Um, the, it's that when, if you understand its energy levels, you can track them all the way along this deformation. So, so if you take um, this equation and you think of it as deforming the, the interaction Hamiltonian, um, then, you know, as you go along the trajectory, you're changing uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Um, by this this operator, uh, you can also use in Zolmanovich's words the very meaning of the stress energy tensor to identify the spatial components with uh, pressure DEDL, and you can include um, the angular momentum as Rajesh was asking. Um, let's work with dimensionless quantities, so this uh, curly E will be that uh, here, and you derive a differential equation here. Um, this differential equation. Um, should be solved with a boundary condition that the energy levels uh, agree with the seed theory, the CFT at uh, y equals zero, the beginning of the trajectory. Um, and those we can, of course, write in terms of the dimensions delta of the, that theory uh, in this way. Okay, and in particular, we wanna work with a CFT that's truly holographic, um, sparse light spectrum, or even stronger conditions than that. Um, once you have that, specification, then Hartman et al. showed that the famous Cardi formula for the entropy is just purely in the 2D uh, description. One can show that the Cardi formula, uh, which agrees with the area uh, formula in gravitational language, starts um, not, it, it doesn't just apply asymptotically as it was originally proven, but instead it, it starts 
at uh, the energy level corresponding to delta of order C over six. Um, and those um, energy levels are, um, you know, that energy scale is also associated with the Hawking cage transition. Um, and uh, all we need is that you get the uh, correct entropy formula for um, states at and above this level. Um, by correct, I just mean the one that agrees with, with uh, holography. There's a refinement of this uh, due to sin, which also is minus three log of, of this leading bit. And that'll be important for us in a way that um, you might already be able to guess given what I've said. Okay, so that's the seed theory. The, this differential equation is very humane. There's an easy general solution to it um, uh, with you know, a branch choice here. Uh, this lambda two parameter eta sitting inside, that's the nonlinear effect of it that I stressed earlier. And uh, some integration constant here, which we use to fix the energy spectrum to be what it is at the start of the trajectory. And then also at the point where we um, go off in the lambda two direction. Okay. Um, and now let's come to talk to about what it corresponds to on the gravity side. Um, as was already said, uh, it has to do with bringing in the boundary. Um, yeah, not exactly moving in the bulk, but literally bringing in the boundary. And so now let me consider this possibility of a, of a fixed boundary condition wall. So um, at least the most naive thing you can try, which people have worked on, it's quite subtle actually um, in the general case, but anyway, let's just go with it for now, is a Dirichlet condition, so the metric fix. Um, that means the, the radial momentum, the extrinsic curvature is, is free. Um, and this brown York energy is defined in a, in a very intuitive way as the variation of the on-shell action with respect to this boundary metric, um, which you can work out, takes this form in terms of the extrinsic curvature. Um, this extrinsic curvature piece of it is the kind of active ingredient. There's some counterterm stuff you can just add uh, pretty freely uh, that is sitting in this other term here. But um, um, that's the, the basic definition of stress energy that we'll talk about on the on the gravity side. And again, um, uh, Bella Subramanian and Krauss introduced this early on as, as the interpretation of the, of the ADS CFT, CFT uh, stress energy tensor. So um, we're working on these cylinder slices uh, again. So let's take this Dirichlet condition to be a cylinder. Um, and what you find, and this is this was the big insight of McGuff Museum and Verlinda some years ago, is that um, the Einstein equations package can be packaged or you know imply the same differential equation that Zon Logikov and company had found for uh, essentially what turns out to be the same quantity, the energy, uh, which is uh, in this language, you know, the uh, TT component of the stress tensor. So the same differential equation is um, encoded in the Einstein equations. Um, dictionary is going to look familiar from just usual ADS3 CFT2 um, with the addition of this lambda parameter um, being G Newton L and eta is related to the uh, bulk cosmological constant which can be positive or negative and this all goes through. Okay so um, Dirichlet boundaries and other types of boundary conditions are weirdly a very active area of research still, and it's subtle. Um, here's kind of a laundry list of some of that. Um, uh, there's, in the general case, in four dimensions, there the initial boundary value problem is not doesn't make sense. Um, uh, but um, one can so that sort of in the general case in 40, one might be led to something else like a proposed better behaved boundary condition uh, involving fixing, you know, basically a different ensemble somehow, which fixes uh, other stuff like the boundary conformal class of the metric and the trace of the extrinsic curvature. And that's been in integrated into this uh, TT bar plus lambda two story as well. Um, we're not hitting these subtleties yet in the 3D version. So we're gonna stick with the most kind of intuitive version of the Dirichlet wall for now. Um, but I, I just want to stress this. This is actually an interesting area of research um, still happening. So, um, you know, what exactly is the best boundary condition to be to be thinking about? 
in the case of ultimate interest. So, so Eva, I have, I have a question. Yes. Uh, somewhere along the way in the present, maybe in higher dimensions, at least in, in your finite G Newton, right, once again, not directly related to what you said, it should be important that, you know, there's some gate choice involved in moving the boundary inwards. You know, I mean, what you define by a boundary of finite R probably depends on some, some choice of gate. And do, do you know where that might appear in this, in this way of looking at things? You know, because finite R isn't well defined. I have to define it maybe with relation to the boundary at infinity. And then- Oh, it's, it's certainly not um, defined by some coordinate R. It is defined by saying, I demand there be a cylinder of proper size L with, you know, the cylinder flat geometry. Um, and I yeah, I mean- the, Yeah, proper size of the cylinder defines, will define what the-, what the yeah. Exactly, exactly. And that's because the, you know, the boundary theory just doesn't know about any of this, like for it, the gravity is emerging. And so it just lives on some cylinder of that size. So it's, it's the right thing to do also from that perspective. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it, in, um, in a nutshell, we can use this method to address two natural patches of the sitter that are, the, you know, really line up very nicely with this approach. Um, and with, as, as we'll see, the, the point that the, you would expect a finite number of states. So um, there's this, the sitter of Penner's diagram is here, the static patch for some observer here would be this whole triangle in the global system. We consider a time-like boundary that might, we can move it around, but we, we say at one point in the trajectory, it sits here and uh, we can fill in in one of the two directions. And we fill in, as I'm indicating on the right, we get what we call the pole patch, which includes the, the pole over here. Um, and instead, if we fill in the other direction, we get what we call the cosmic horizon patch because it includes the cosmic horizon. Um, this one on the left-hand side uh, is by far the more interesting one. The one on the right is the one we first encountered. And the reason is that the one on the left involves noticing that you can connect to the second branch of the square root in, in a continuous trajectory, which um, is, is obvious actually in retrospect, but we hadn't quite um, noticed that initially. So, um, but in both cases, it's the same method that I summarized earlier. That is you start with the CFT, you do pure TT bar up to some why not at which you can consistently begin turning on TT bar plus lambda two. Um, and you, uh, Fill in on filling in on either side at a technical level corresponds to uh, having this trajectory yield an energy formula with one or the other sign of the square root in the Desider phase, and um, that makes sense with the geometric version of the stress energy I mentioned. In the sense that, I mean, you can immediately see that the extrinsic curvature just flips sign if you if you fill in one way or the other. So there's a role. For both sides of that of that branch cut, um, so let me just quickly describe sorry, what's going on, sorry, sorry, on the gravity side for each of them. But yeah, go ahead, super. So at some point, I got I got confused when you jumped from ADS to the DS picture. This is a question asked earlier, so I apologize for asking again. Uh, in, in DS, I would have thought the natural thing that the TT bar would do would move you from the boundary at late times to a boundary at finite times. So how did we go from uh, I mean, could you please explain the picture that you had in the previous page? Yeah, I, I, I no, I'm absolutely going to do that. That's the next step. I was oh, sort of nice. okay. flashing what's going to, yeah. Um, um, let's definitely keep asking. But the thing is, the reason that we, you'll see, let's, let's go over it. And then let's talk again about the comparison to the case you have in mind. Um, in a nutshell, I would say the case you have in mind is more difficult simply because there's no prescription for that CFT you would start from you know, in, in the uh, future boundary, it's just uh, highly conjectural. Whereas here we can anchor it with ADS CFT, just good old ADS CFT. So that we have to go a long way from that, <laughs> sort of like going from the D brains to the black hole, you have to really go quite a long way. It's qualitatively different, but you can do it. Um, and so it's anchored with good old ADS CFT. It has the same essential dictionary, the gravity is fluctuating and, and so on. So, um, so I have a more naive question. Please. So <clears throat> the boundary, the the straight line boundary, mm -hmm. it corresponds to the sphere, uh, the extra dimensional sphere going to zero radius, right? 
Well, so, so this isn't about, let, let me be clear about the picture. The, the red is the boundary I'm talking about. It's a cylinder. Um, we could move it all the way to the pole and then it'd be a tiny little cylinder, which would become a, a line, a world line. Yeah. So when you, when you pull it inwards, it becomes a different manifold. I mean, it becomes a higher dimensional manifold than the one you are talking about when you're considering just a straight line, right? Oh, well, so the generic case is that it's a cylinder and the case of the world line would be kind of a limiting, limiting cylinder would just be come, um, you know, arbitrarily small there, but it's, you can just keep it, just keep it as a finite cylinder for this purpose that we're talking about. If you're asking, are we planning to get back to the global picture? I think that might be the spirit of your question. I'll tell you how we yeah. do that. I'll tell you how we do that. And it's different from what you're what your um, question has in mind. Um, it's, uh, we'll see, but you can take this patch, the Cosmic Horizon patch and join them up um, and get the global picture, but it's different from just pulling this to the boundary. Um, okay. I, I wanna notice, I wanna also, it, with respect to relations to, you know, many other works going on, there's, um, there was recent work by um, uh, Chandrasekharan Pennington Longo Witten that, uh, also had to introduce something else to the static patch to make sense of it. And uh, in that sense, this boundary is like uh, what in, in that paper's case, if, you, if you've heard of it, it was uh, kind of an observer, an explicit observer. So you always have to introduce something to, to um, make sense of this, um, uh, so this patch physics. So this is like, I, I think this is actually um, more natural from the point of view of ADS-CFT, to, to get toward a dual, but um, I think maybe I should, let's keep discussing, and I, I actually have time until I have to teach, but I don't wanna keep you too late, but um, let me at least get through the, for now the, um, where this came from in the gravity side. So indeed the idea is to start from ADS, the CFT uh, uh, dual to ADS, uh, bring in this Dirichlet boundary in this pole patch case all the way to where it is a tiny little uh, cylinder well below the, the ADS scale. Um, at that point, the energy formula couldn't care less whether it's uh, got this uh, lambda two or not. And on the gravity side, you really can't tell that you're an ADS or DS uh, in these dimensions. You just have this uh, tiny cylinder. It could be in flat ADS or DS. Um, and that's why everything is continuous. If you then move it back out, but now in a way with a lambda two, and that builds up the brown York energy corresponding to the radial um, uh, geometry of not the ADS in this case, but the DS patch that, that we're talking about here. So what this trajectory corresponds very precisely to, very precisely in the sense of exact match of dressed energies and brown York energies, um, is um, bringing in the ADS boundary to where you can't tell the difference between ADS and DS, and then bringing it out um, to, in a way that uh, captures the, the DS geometry. Um, and on the deformed field theory side, that uh, ladder is done via this TT bar plus lambda two deformation. Um, so <clears throat> that is the pole patch version of this. The cosmic horizon patch is more interesting. And in that case, what we do is we focus on a band of energy levels, basically right at the delta equals C over six level that I mentioned earlier. Um, in the CFT, that's the place where the Cardi formula begins to apply universally and for holographic CFTs or for anything with a sparse light spectrum. And um, it massively dominates the entropy, so any kind of universal thing. We start from that energy level um, to think about the effect of the deformation. We then, again, bring in the boundary um, in this kind of purple line to the point where once again, you actually can't tell the difference between this black hole in ADS, which is a horizon, and any other horizon, like the De Sitter cosmic horizon. Um, they are not distinguishable when you're right near them. And similarly, again, the energy formula reflects that. Um, the way it happens in this case is that at this matching point between um, where you think of it as a horizon of a black hole in ADS and a horizon of the De Sitter uh, static patch, what's happening is the square root part of the energy formula just goes to zero. So who cares whether there's an eta in there or not, it doesn't, it's zero. Um, 
And you can then again, continuously turn on the TT Barcelona 2 trajectory. What that corresponds to is bringing the boundary back out from the horizon, but now in a way that gives you the geometry of De Sitter. So it's a different theory um, as it should be to, to capture De Sitter. The energy formula has this uh, lambda two effect in there um, that matches the energy. Okay, so that's the basis of the statement that we cleanly capture the radial geometry uh, as emerging from this construction. And as far as the entropy goes, it goes along for the ride. And that's because um, what's happening with these solvable deformations is the levels don't cross and the count of stage just continues. And everything is continuous in terms of the energy levels. So um, we, kept, we just track those states in a simple way in this, in this um, method that, again, is, a, I think, a nice analog of the black hole case where people used instead uh, extended supersymmetry for that. Here we use this, and we keep track of the same of the states. Um, now, what, what's going on with that, with the count of states? Um, uh, so we talked about their energy values and how that relates to the geometry. The count of states, um, I'm still trying to move the zoom stuff around, um, is, is uh, <clears throat> it's in the middle, sorry, um, <laughs> uh, is um, uh, affected by another important feature of the TT bar type deformations, which is that these dressed energies, um, having the square root in uh, form that I have flashed a few times with the integration constant solved by matching to the seed theory, whose energies appear here, we see um, that for high enough values of those energies, whatever, fixing everything else here, the square root goes complex, uh, it goes imaginary. So the energies formally go complex. And um, that means that the real part of the spectrum is finite. And in fact, in the construction I gave, it's not just finite, but it's the right value for the for the refined gibbons Hawking entropy. Um, so you, people take different attitudes toward these extra states. Um, my, you know, the simplest thing to do is just prioritize unitarity above all and drop them. It's a well-defined theory. Now it's just a quantum mechanics theory, um, which, by the way, then has a type one operator algebra, which has you know, e to the s by e to the s <laughs> uh, matrix Hamiltonian, but it's finite. Um, the uh, states well, states below this energy level are model dependent and they depend on the bulk matter. Um, so we'll defer the discussion of those till we incorporate the local bulk matter. Um, in this simple theory, they do whatever they do, but they're highly subdominant in the entropy. Um, Okay. So even I'm, I'm missing so, something. Which yes. Maybe like, uh, what yeah. was the boundary condition as lambda goes to zero? I mean, the boundary condition of the TT bar deformation for your case. Yes, it was that. It was that uh, the spectrum matches that of the CFT, and that's why. What? So before, when I wrote this formula, there was some integration constant in there. Now, uh, I'm writing it with that fixed uh, by those seed energies. I see. So I see. So now, now, okay. So maybe this is. I mean, this is what is confusing me. Uh, you know, in, in what you're doing, if I understood correctly, this TT bar you can think of effectively as imposing some Hamiltonian constraint, right? This is, I guess, what Witten's point was also in his recent paper. We're also keeping like, and then this TT bar tells you what happens as you move away from the asymptotic limit. What's confusing hold, me here? Hold, hold, hold on. So, well, yeah, you can see gesturing like you're doing a space like that. No, no, I want to do a time like boundary, the okay, one that okay. you're doing. Yeah. What's confusing me is that in the limit when you take lambda to zero, the metric is still not very large, right? Because there's some point where the decitor has a neck. And in that limit, you're still at some finite volume, right? So- Oh, absolutely. Is, so that's that you're not moving away from uh, asymptotic yeah. somehow, even, no, at, that, even at the limit lambda goes to zero, yeah. No, that, that's, ex that's the, true. It's the right answer. Let me, I think I know what you're getting at. Let me try yeah. and address it quite directly because it's important. So you might, think in ADS-CFT, the reason you have frozen gravity is because of the you know, infinite volume at infinity or something like that. Um, that's not the reason here. 
nor is it the reason the moment you regulate ADS-CFT. The reason is that we have um, fixed boundary conditions for the metric on this wall. Yeah. So the so metric. Yeah. Okay. So the met so metric doesn't fluctuate. Um, it's the right answer, and the energy formulas reflect this. That um, the variation of this y in this direction only goes over a range that corresponds precisely to what you're saying. That uh, you know, it no, it doesn't like it, it matches this, and it doesn't go further. Um, um, so uh, I want to move it to the right. So I, I want. Well, to you move can it move. You can move it to the right as well. Um, right. But it doesn't. So that that's making the cylinder smaller. I mean, sorry, it's not making the cylinder smaller, and the CFT is making little lambda um, uh, bigger. Um, but uh, oh, oh, I see. Oh, sorry. Then I misunderstood. Oh, so lambda equal to zero is the point where you have the bifurcation to surface. That's no, no, no. no. Uh, so um, when is um, lambda equal to zero? Isn't it to the extreme right? So lambda equal to zero is at the CFT. Um, uh, and lambda equal to zero is at CFT. The, the, this point at the bifurcation surface is some finite value. Actually, the y naught is um, see the dimensionless variable here is lambda squared over uh, over uh, or sorry lambda over l squared l being the size of the cylinder. Um, so what's happening in this pole patch case where you match at the pole? Is that the y naught is gigantic? Um, what's happening in the cosmic horizon case where you match at the at the horizon is that you have a, a just a finite value of this y naught. Um, oh, I understood. I think I see. So let me look at the pole patch case, which is I think the one I was assuming you had. So then lambda equal to zero is at the pole, right? Lambda equals to zero is at the CFT. Lambda going to infinity is what's happening at the pole. Um, Oh, I see. And and lambda equal to zero geometrically in the pole patch is it, I should think of as what boundary? Where, where it, does it's, this... it's 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 lambda equal zero does not is not um does not exist in the pole patch. So the, the part of the trajectory that describes moving the boundary around in the pole patch runs uh -huh. from um you know la lambda equals infinity back to some finite value, but it doesn't it doesn't um oh I see. I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. Sorry. So, so, so maybe this is something I'm not. So, you're saying the pole patch already corresponds to having moved in far in from lambda equal to zero. Is exactly. Correct? Exactly. So, so if let me maybe it helps to go. Yeah. Let me go back to this picture. So, yeah, we got there from ADSFT bringing the boundary all the way in, and that's like lambda going all the way to infinity. But then we can reduce lambda again, adding this lambda two. Uh, yeah. So that's. I see. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for the questions. It's the point <laughs> to get things across. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the count of states uh, goes along for the ride, and at this point, it's important that um, this uh, you know it all calculation I alluded to of this log agrees with the corresponding one for BTC black holes in in ADS due to send some years ago. Who also finds this minus three? <laughs> so for our uh, construction, it had to work out that way that they that they agreed because the pure gravity stuff just is subject to this integrability of the deformation, and then and the numbers just had to match. And so that's a check, um, including this log. Um, there's some previous entropy in the literature. Uh, sorry, numerology in the literature that um, that this matches as well. Okay. Um, so this this is just a summary of of all that, um, and uh, it goes as far as I described the state count and the radial emergent geometry, but it captures nothing else. Um, so I want to work on that next, unless there are further questions. Um, okay, so so one of the questions already was if we wanted to go away from the bounded patches, um, how might we construct the global space? And well, one could take these bounded patches as building blocks, uh, join them up and do, do a final integral over the gravity at the boundary, the metric of the boundary. That final integral would reflect the fact that if you work with a global de Sitter, you do not escape uh, the fluctuating gravity. But you know, this could still, um, you know, that, that's the right answer. And uh, for the global case that you would need an integral over gravity and you would see it in this framework in this way. And 
um, still the the building blocks of these patches is is um, you know perhaps useful on the way to that. Um, um, some years ago with Dong and, and Tarobo, we calculated the um, the um, entanglement entropy and the Rainy entropies in the global decider, uh, separating the system into the two halves of the of the system. Um, think about that state at the neck of decider. And we find we found that it has a, a flat entanglement spectrum. All the Rainy entropies agreed with each other. Um, and what these microstates that we're finding now do is, is they sit uh, at, on, you know, as the at the microstates in that maximally entangled state. Um, um, so they fit into that uh, result, playing the role of, of the microstates in such a um, such an expansion, where you know in the ADS black hole case, there's some finite temperature there, and in the Desider uh, neck, it's a uh, effectively an infinite uh, temperature. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, this is just a bit more detail on that. Um, probably not important given the time. Um, so let me move now to the matter. So far, I described something that matches perfectly at the level of pure gravity, but um, there's you know a world of models of quantum field theory that should live on to sitter in our world, of course, we know what that is. Um, and it's important to capture the, the local physics of that bulk matter properly as well. Um, just doing this pure TT bar plus lambda two doesn't accomplish that. Um, uh, you can think about that as from you know, the start of the procedure where we add this double trace operator that changes the boundary conditions for, for gravity, but doesn't do anything to those of um, the other fields in the bulk. Um, so, but the same procedure, the same idea of treating the theory space, constructing theories in, in theory space via a differential equation of this sort, that persists with um, bulk matter being able to be incorporated through additional terms in the deformation, um, not surprisingly. Um, so at first one understands, and this was due to a, a, a paper of um, Hartman, Kutov, Shigulian, and Tajdini, that um, you know exactly how to do this, basically adding to the Einstein equations that we use to derive the energy formula or the formula for trace of T equals stuff, one can simply add in the contribution to those equations from bulk matter and apply again the definition of the Brown-York stress energy to define determine what, what it is one should add to the deformation uh, in order to generalize it to produce the right boundary conditions that are local for all the fields. Um, so one could do that and it's you know it's a, it's a very clear understood thing to do uh, in the large C regime. Um, so the issue with it is that unlike TT bar by itself, uh, which has strong factorization properties that that make it solvable, um, as I should have stressed earlier, not just in some large C, uh, you know, sort of holographic approximation, but, but you know, straight up finite C exactly solvable. Those properties do not apply to general, you know, corrections of, of this form I'm writing here as sort of OO. Um, however, um, we realized recently that we can still, that there's a big world of, of opportunity between um, not only the theory being finite, having this finite spectrum of states, but also having this easy solvability in terms of factorization of the of the irrelevant operator. There's a big window of opportunity where we lose the factorization, say for these other operators that we're going to want to add. But um, even though it doesn't factorize, we can still work with a finite theory. So it's a well-defined theory. Um, and the way we can do that is we apply the tiniest of TT bar applications at deformations at first to make the whole thing finite, at which point we start adding all the matter stuff to make uh, for a good boundary condition for all the fields. And you know that'll give us finite everything. So finite matrix elements, even for these other uh, irrelevant operators, um, even though they don't factorize. Okay, so um, that's the second point here. 
Um, a third point is, and this is something I also take very seriously, uh, is that, well, string theory is still by far the best candidate for quantum gravity. It accommodates the sitter very nicely, but the way that happens is through um, internal topology that's quite different from the internal uh, geometry and topology that you get for simple ADS-CFT solutions, which are obtained from compactifications on spheres, for example, with flux uh, and desider. Instead, you find examples simplest lately being on, uh, say, compact hyperbolic spaces, which have quite different topology. Um, but um, so you might say this whole business of deforming from one to the other is doomed because those internal spaces are so, so different. Um, but there's a there's an interesting point here, which is that actually recall that we do the the matching at the horizon. So we brought the boundary into the horizon. Um, if you have a boundary at the horizon, it's effectively at super high temperature. Okay, so whatever's going on internally is is compelled to to mix up. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that all topologies are connected in string theory. Um, so if we bring in that, um, it's saying that. Uh, that feature of the matching point of the two trajectories, uh, the part of the trajectory that describes bounded ADS and the part that describes bounded DS, uh, where we match at the at the horizon, um, that matching point also um, is indistinguishable in the internal space in this sense. Um, okay, so this is a quick summary of things about the matter. Um, let me try to get through a little bit of it because it's what I promised, um, uh, but I did want to ground it on on the, the main result about gravity and the entropy and state count and so on. So as I was just saying, there's beautiful works existing in the literature showing how to generalize to other fields and um, the trace of the stress tensor, which is like the D by D lambda of log Z uh, contribution gets uh, not just TT bar, but you, one adds for, for all the light fields, some um, what's called OO, some uh, similar similar uh, quadratic operators dual to other fields. The operator specifically, um, the dictionary between such an operator and the gravity side is that the um, operator is the radial uh, momentum in the sense of evolving radially. It's that that momentum. So if you have a scalar field phi, um, the operator O uh, is its radial momentum at the boundary, basically, you know, in the simplest case, d by dr of phi at the boundary. Um, so we know what it is. It sits here. Um, you can also think about curvature, and we still have lambda 2. Um, there's a similar story. In fact, that's what this uh, Hartman et al. paper was about for higher dimensions. Um, there's a particular case that we can most easily control in which the operator involved here is uh, some current related to gauge fields in the bulk. Um, and kind of related to what Subrat was asking in, a, in another sense, people are thinking about T squared deformations also for the space-like approach to, to sitter holography. And, and there's also interesting news about Wheeler-DeWitt solutions related to that sort of organization of the problem. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on with all of this. Um, let me just explain a little bit about how we incorporate matter into our our duality. Um, uh, hi, 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 but what is a small question? So yeah. in the in the last slide, like what this d squared deformation in higher dimension? If we like, replace t by this pi, it looks like the Hamiltonian constant. Is there any relation between them, or if we just uh, if we just replace the t by this pi of gravity? This momentum, it looks like the Hamiltonian constant, the deformation itself. Is there any relation yeah. between them? Yeah, yeah. So uh, earlier in the talk, I mean, you could ask this in 3D as well. Earlier in the talk, um, I mentioned that the Einstein equations imply the um, dress energy equa differential equation. The amazing thing again being, I mean, we're kind of used to this at this point in the field, but yeah, the amazing thing being that there was this zonological dressed energy equation, and it's the same as Einstein equations. But I should have been more specific. It's the um, application of the radial Hamiltonian constraint, radial version of the Hamiltonian constraint, not the actual Hamiltonian constraint, combined with 
the definition of the brown york energy, that's what leads to this, this formula. Um, so um, yeah, so that, that you can also get the energy, dress energy formula from a different subset of the Einstein equations, the, the actual Hamiltonian constraint, the TT1. Um, and, um, and again, the, the definition of this of the brown york. So yeah, you're totally right. It's a processing of, of those those equations. Um, I see, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Again, again, to one has to keep clear that this is in a context where there is a fixed metric, uh, fi fixed boundary condition for the metric. So it's in that sense not not the usual situation. Um, but um, and that's why, in fact, you can have a net energy. <laughs> So yeah, let me, let me actually pause on that to make sure it's totally clear. You, so you mentioned the Hamiltonian constraint um, in a global situation that says the sort of naive notion of energy is, is just zeroed out. When you have uh, a fixed boundary condition for the metric, it means you're not varying the boundary metric, which means you're not imposing that sort of analog of Gauss's law. You have a net energy and there's no problem with it. And that, that net er energy is this brown York energy. Okay. so. Um, Here's some stuff about matter. Um, basically, what we want to do is uh, understand the effect of uh, weakly interacting quantum fields on things like the dress energy formula, on the causality properties of these patches, um, and uh, also work out more of the details of what we argue is still a finite system, just a more complicated finite system, one in which there's not this um, simple factorization property. So um, to go a little further toward that, and I, I, I um, realize I'm getting out of time, uh, is you know a matter of working out some, some solutions. I mean, just to get a sense for what's going on, we've got some solutions with some bulk matter. Um, for example, we can work with some, a massless scalar, which is dual to a uh, uh, vector boson. And, in uh, 3D ADS and DS. And uh, there's a lot of work in, in ADS CFT already to do with uh, uh, putting in some scalar fields and looking at what can turn out to be quite wild, um, turbulent behavior, um, but just kind of working those things out at the simplest order of approximation gives nice formulas into which um, embeds which embed nicely into the, the dressed energy formulas. Um, so that, that this is just to say that one can work out the, the energy levels with such uh, quantum fields fluctuating and contributing um, you know, details to the energy levels. Um, and it, it fits into the same, the same framework. And for example, here's uh, an example of a, of a solution which has uh, an effect on the brown York energy that um, comes from exciting above the vacuum some scalar fields whose back reaction on the metric is taken into account consistently with the, the fixed uh, cylinder boundary uh, conditions, the fixed proper size of that boundary cylinder. So, I mean, part of the point of this is that when we do imp impose such boundary conditions, it really can come out quite differently from what we would get if we imposed the appropriate conditions uh, to do with the global decider. So for example, there's this very standard thing um, related to the sort of interesting complications of global decider, uh, which, which is that if, if you take a uh, decider and you put sane matter in it, um, uh, then those excitations make the decider Penrose diagram taller. And so if you imagine thinking about static patches that begin uh, correlated but not interacting, they they end up overlapping, and you know that's an interesting thing to think about in the in the global case. Um, but in uh, these bounded patches, things work out more simply, and again, more like it does in ADS CFT. So, um, for example, one can work out that the um, you know, positive excitation of the system is what corresponds to having properly you know, non-singular bulk solutions for the scalar field, which whose back reaction on the metric in, in the variables I gave in the previous slide where this was some metric component um, gives a particular sign for, for that. Um, but the point is that non-singular corresponds to positive energy. Again, um, you have the normal sign of DEDS. 
the um, another consequence here is that for the poll patch, uh, which we've worked this out for so far, um, indeed in the bounded system, the patch gets actually wider, not taller when we excite it. Um, so there's this theorem by Galvin Wald um, for global decider uh, that uh, is the official way of saying what I said here. Um, <clears throat> and just by example, we're seeing that it doesn't have to work that way with the boundary uh, fixed. And you can kind of understand that because we're forcing the system to have a like a giant cylinder here, giant compared to what it would want to do if it, if, if it were excited and forced uh, in the global case to shrink, to go toward a crunch. Um, if instead we put the boundary condition associated with the cylinder, um, then the equations you know, work out differently and uh, this is the result. So that's the kind of added you know, sim simplification that is, is coming out. Um, Oops, so let's see. Um, we can do charged black holes, and that dresses, in the sense I've been talking about, to a kind of electrically charged de Sitter horizon, which is an interesting configuration um, that we're playing with. Um, I already said this in words, but um, we also have an argument that the finiteness of the real Hilbert space will persist if we set up our theory uh, appropriately um, in the sense I, I already described. And um, that's exciting because the real hang up for this and even then also the higher dimensional versions has been, oh, TT bar is so, you know, it's great that it can be calculated, uh, you know, that can be controlled along these deformations, but it's so special. The, the factorization property of it is which really um, leading to that, um, that uh, result. But again, there's a difference between easy solvability via factorization and just being finite. <laughs> uh, and once a, a system is finite, then all operators are well-defined. There's not you know, infinite ambiguity to do with uh, these other uh, irrelevant operators either. It's just that they don't, they don't factorize. And that makes sense. The you know, detailed physics of matter fields shouldn't be totally integrable or else uh, there'd be a, you know, that, that'd be sort of too simple for what we expect um, in this uh, full model with the matter. But uh, we're saying that it still can be a finite system that um, if, you know, there's nothing missing in this argument that also implies that the type one operator algebra that we trivially find from the finiteness of the spectrum will be the, the answer, at least for this, this system, um, uh, when we consider finite G Newton um, with matter. The paper on von Neumann algebra, as I mentioned earlier, um, got things started from really the opposite end of the problem. That, so they focused on the quantum fields and consider, put in the tiniest effect of gravity and then took G Newton uh, away in, in sort of that order of limits. And they were able to get the type three algebra of quantum field theory down to type two, which at least has a well-defined entropy, um, which is a very interesting observation. Also involved a, a kind of um, specification of not exactly a boundary, but an observer there. Um, but it was left un uncertain whether or not when you go to finite G Newton, you have still type two algebra or, or type one. Um, and, you know, we have, an argument that it can be constructed to give still type one. Um, so that um, is fun. In fact, the types of algebra maps pretty nice to the types of fun, if you know what that is. And so um, uh, I wanted to share that argument. There's also a connection to some of the observations in the literature regarding the interpretation of temperature, uh, which, which works out. Um, and I already gave the, uh, summary of, of this argument about how even with the different internal geometry and string theory, uh, we can proceed in this way of starting from ADS, CFT, deforming it, going to a place where you can't tell the difference between ADS and DS, and then deforming um, with this lambda 2 plus TT bar plus OO and so on. Um, because when you're at the horizon, um, let me just skip to that, you know, when you're at the horizon, 
even though the internal topologies are super are very different, they're forced to mix with each other. So in that sense, you, it's still true, even with all the mess of the internal dimensions of, of string theory and M theory, it's still true that at the matching point, you can't tell the difference between the two. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I can you know share the slides um, with those who want to might have wanted to see more of the details of those points. But since it's a bit over time, let me just stop here and leave you with this summary and we can have more discussion as much as you like. Uh, thanks, Eva, for the nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, I, ha I have a question. Like when, when you consider the JJ bar or the PT bar, is the understanding that, uh, I mean, these, these terms can be simplified by integrating in some vector or scalar, or in the case of the TT bars, a, a two index object, uh, and then kind of, uh, after you have integrated in those, uh, those fields, you can mm -hmm. then integrate, in, integrate out the the ingredients of the J and J and J bar or the T and T bar in the sense that suppose you have, suppose J is psi bar gamma mu psi and J bar is something similar to that psi gamma mu psi bar, then you can integrate in a phi or an A mu, which couples to the J mu. And then you can consider that, consider integrating out the shies. So then you will have an action for the A's in the bulk from bound bulk boundary propagators so is is that the way that the j's are actually leading to some kind of vector like objects ah uh, so good so the way that both t relates to the bulk metric and j relates to the bulk age field is as it is in ads cft um yeah yeah so it's it's yeah, it's the same thing. So in, I mentioned earlier that um, T is related to the extrinsic curvature at the boundary, and that's nothing but the you know radial pi, so to speak, the radial momentum of the metric at the boundary. Um, that's also how it is in ADS CFT. People there do this thing with expanding around asymptotic infinity, but what's going on is <laughs> there's a radial pi and the radial you know, field, and you're choosing which one to fix. Um, and usually the standard thing is to fix a Dirichlet condition on the field, and then the radial pi is the operator. And we're just doing exactly the same thing here. It's just that those things can be defined at a finite boundary just as well as at an asymptotic boundary. Um, yeah, when you say integrating in, there, there's, there's a kind of another sense. I don't want to confuse things, but maybe it's interesting to mention. There's another sense, and there's another way in which you can formulate uh, these deformations. Uh, which are again rigid deformed field theories. They're not gravitational theories in themselves, but still you can, in a different sense, integrate in a, a metric or or a vector field. Uh, there's a kind of construction of these via a kernel um, that was done most. Um, so it was done originally by uh, Dubovsky, uh, Mirbabai, uh, uh, Gorbenko, and um, others. Um, and there's a more kind of powerful version that was developed by uh, uh, Ronak Soni and, and Basu Shyam and Edward Mazank, um, where you can, uh, just in the 2D theory proper, just this is not about getting the, the emergent gravity fields, but just in the 2D theory, you can actually get recover the same results, the addressed energies and all that through an interesting path integral construction uh, where you introduce, um, basically you integrate the seed theory against uh, the kind of uh, fiducial um, 2D metric or 2D gauge field um, here. So, but um, let me know if that helped with your question. Yeah, I mean, uh, and then can you think of, uh, I mean, once you have the, bulk operators uh, the uh, suppose a vector field or the metric mm -hmm. can you then can you then think about doing an hkll uh, projection back to the boundary 
and uh, i mean it will obviously be a smeared kind of object uh, the object in the boundary absolutely uh, and, and and then you can uh, uh, you can you can fourier transform those uh, objects to get uh, i mean essentially a tower of states which correspond to the bulk object because once you have that smeared kind of thing which is which is which is which is enclosed in a certain uh, uh, certain sub manifold of the total manifold uh, you can always think about expanding that object which is in the sub manifold in terms of uh, in, in some some fourier transform or something like that uh, and get uh, more operators i mean get a, a tower of states which correspond to the object in the bulk you can do that you can do hkll we actually did do that in one of the papers i i'm not sure i even reference it here but a paper with itor lefkowitz and uh uh so lefkowitz new uh and Taroba, we we did an hkll study of these things um at that point we hadn't realize this business of how to construct the cosmic horizon patch and we were focusing on um we included the pole patch as i described it here but uh we're focusing also on some other patches like uh ds boundaries um so but in those cases that we covered in that paper we we actually worked out some of the hkll so yeah that's another um thing we can Direction. technology that we can indeed import from adscft so yeah yeah Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Priyadarshi has a question. Uh, uh, hi. Yeah, so, so Friedel has a paper in this, I think it was eight or nine. So there, I think he constructed some like kernel for some 3D gravity from some 2D jet safety. So is there a relation of that those that calculation with this TT bar plus lambda to this for pure gravity case? Uh, uh, there, there, there is. In fact, um, with the lambda two, it was a paper by uh, Toroba building from the paper I mentioned earlier by um, by Mazink, uh, Shyam, and, and Sony, where uh, they were highly motivated by the Friedel paper and um, processed it into this, this kernel construction. So yeah, if you the, the most recent is a is a paper by Gonzalo Taroba himself um, that you could yeah you could find in the literature. I see. And also, like when you are going from ADS to DS, so should not that uh, central charge also get some imaginary uh, part uh, for analytic continuation? Why that does not happen here? Like, yeah, no, that's a great question. Let me just stress again: everything here is um, uh, we're we're definitely not constructing to sitter by some kind of analytic continuation. Um, what's happening instead is a See, yeah, that kind of analytic continuation um, would be also a disaster from the point of view of the you know string M theory, where you could formally get consider by kind of rotating those fluxes on the on the internal sphere by by an eye or something. But um, it it's you need a, a nonsensical theory to do to do that. Um, that it's important that that's not what we're doing. We're starting from ADS CFT. It's no, everything's normal. C is real. Um, and the degrees of freedom remain real the, the entire time. We're, it's a time-like boundary. We do this long trajectory uh, that I that I described here to get from the ADS patch to the Desider patches. Um, but all along the way, C is real. Um, people are adventuring with trying to sort of um, do something that might be closer to what you're asking about, where um, when you're at the horizon and trying to sort of jump into the upper triangle instead of um, the other things we do, like moving around in the static patch, then they'll encounter some eyes like that. And there's work in progress on, on that, I think, by the Cambridge group going on now, for example, and, and uh, Sony and uh, Aaron Wall and some of those uh, are, folks are doing that. Um, I don't know the current status of it, but just to be very clear, what I've done today has none of that. It's, it's all real. Um, this might have to do with whether you're doing it in the spatial slice or in the timeline slice. This issue, yes. is, as you said. Yes. I, I, thanks. I think there is another question by Theodore. Uh -huh. Hi, Eva. Yeah, I have a question about when matter is added, the effect on the entropy. 
I would have thought from a bulk viewpoint that um, adding a matter field renormalizes Newton's constant, and so it should affect, you know, proportionally to the area, it should affect the entropy. And I'm just wondering whether that's visible somehow within the deformed CFT approach that you're taking. So those corrections, yeah, they, they, I mean, at the level of things that one can compute semi-classically on the gravity side, those sort of almost, almost taught a lot of tautologically port over to the other side. Um, so yeah, things like perturbation theory and one over C, which is it, it would it would be a um, a contribution that would arise in in perturbation theory in one over C, um, uh, you know, in the field theory side or the deformed field theory side. Um, yeah, I you can yeah you can ask. Um, so the G that the G that appears in. Um your original entropy formula is determined by C in the CFT, right? Right, right. Um, so then the question, I guess, when you add, when you deform the CFT with the matter addition, does C remain unchanged somehow? I mean, well, by definition, it's whatever C you started with, but I mean, does the effective C of the deformed theory change? So I would say that the, yeah, um, the C, is just the same. It's just that we're constructing a different theory. Um, in one case, with those same degrees of freedom, we're just adding TT bar plus seven two. In the other case, with those same degrees of freedom, we're you know at each step step adding this OO. Um, but what you're asking is, um, so given, given that, given that that's the thing that's held fixed, um, if we compare the situation. With, I mean, um, I guess I, I just want to be, be clear about what we might be holding fixed. But we're in this oh, construction. I see. Yeah, I want to say we're C is C is the same, um, but we can compare, for example, a state with a black hole versus a state where there's a black hole plus a matter fluctuating around, and that'll affect you know the the energy. It'll also affect the entropy or the count of states at that at that energy level. Um, but just perturbatively. Yeah, I guess what you're saying is it's as if you um, change the bare gravitational constant such that with the addition of the matter, you got the same one you had in the first originally. That sounds like the right way to package it on the gravity side. But yeah, I, I like the question. I, we'll, we'll think about, um, I mean, I'm sure that C is fixed in this. Um, that's the-, the right correct answer but um mm -hmm. yeah yeah so yeah we're inter you know we're having fun connecting also to your stuff about the first law and um so um if you have other suggestions it'd be welcome but just to get to Ed's question th this is what we do also in ads cfp right because c is just some um, something which is ads scale by gravitational scale and if you add matter, you might have thought as Ted was asking, it gets renormalized. Uh, but you know, it really in the gravitational, in the bulk theory, you only see, see this ratio of ADS scale by, by gravitational scale. Maybe you would see this if you started doing one loop in the bulk theory, and then you'd see you'd have to renormalize it when you add the matter fields. But uh, in, 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 the, in the constraint itself, in the Einstein equation, you only see this figure, which is ADS scale by, by gravitational scale without seeing it. Well, that, that, that's true. That's true. You can, you're, you're allowed to ask, you know, this is aiming for a full definition. It's allowed to ask about the loops in the bulk and, um, and kind of a, just to sort of reiterate at a very pedestrian level, you can take the, re, you know, relation that we got for trace T equals stuff with the OO and, and, and simply build in the quantum corrected effective action. Uh, for that, and as you're saying, um, loop corrections. Um, but yeah, it does have to fit with this fact that C C is just C uh, in this indeed. Um, but you know, level with matter, the interesting thing is from from the two D dual perspective, the new thing, even though it's kind of subleading for purposes of entropy counts and whatnot, it's still more non-trivial in 
in the sense that there's now no reason for levels to not cross. Um, and so things like, like this question can be affected. I'm just stressing that it can be done in a finite theory, <laughs> but it's it, it working everything out is not, you know, trivial. But yeah, that, that kind of pertur perturbation theory um, uh, in, in, in a bulk and it's perturbation theory um, as a function of, of the fixed, you know, one over C is, is available in the usual way, just, yeah. But yeah, so Sumer, just briefly coming back to your point about evolving from the from the sitter to put in a kind of finite cutoff, you, you can certainly do that using the same sort of gravitational relations. Um, and that might be interesting for your your love too. But there it's not that we know some CFT to begin with, right? That that's that's the distinction that yeah. I was um I, I think in, in, in our picture, you know, as we are saying, the Hilbert space would, you know, we have these different states, and each state would correspond to, you know, wave function would correspond to partition function of some CFT. So this this TT bar deformation, I'm guessing, would just tell us what the state is doing in the bar. Now, in this picture that we had, the the value, the behavior of the state at infinity corresponded to some CFT partition function. With in fact these e to the i s terms that will give you this lambda square naturally, I think, and and perhaps also in higher dimensions as we are discussing also other terms that if you're in holographic renormalization, some term which looks like square root g r and and other such terms, which I guess you would expect to add here as well in higher dimensions, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and so I'm guessing if we did that, it would tell us how for a specific state, and that specific state tells you which CFT you have at infinity, how that evolves uh, into the bulk. That's probably what it would tell you. It, it, I'm not sure how to ask a question about entropy in that global perspective. But oh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's harder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Uh, if not, let's thank you for the very nice talk. Okay, thanks very much Thank for the discussion. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. See you again. Bye. Bye.